I just wanted to start off with domestic politics, if I may. How worried are you about the state of the economy? Uh, very. If you look at the figures, um, our growth and productivity rates are, have been very poor over these last years. We're spending more than, well, probably, I don't know, since the 1940s, taxing more. Um, and the outcomes are poor. If you look at the health service, criminal justice, you know, so no, it's, it's a very difficult situation. Now, lots of other countries have, have similar problems, but I think ours are, um, are worse. Do you think people realise how bad and difficult things could be in the years ahead, with mortgages, with cuts, potentially? I think people realise how bad it is. And, you know, to be fair, I think the politicians realise how bad it is. The question is what you do about it. And, you know, in our conference this, this coming week, what we want to do is focus both on what you might do in the short term, and by short term I mean over one parliament, and then the longer term question, which I think is all about the technology revolution. I'm really keen to talk about those points first, um, but just on the economy, Labour of course need to prove, as always, to voters that they can be trusted on the economy, and Gordon Brown famously said he would stick to the Conservative spending plans for the first two years in 97. Do you think it would be sensible for Rachel Reeves to do similar? Well, I think Rachel will make her, her judgment on that. But I think what she has done in the last few years is really restore Labour's economic credibility. And that's incredibly important. And the truth of the matter is that it's going to be a very difficult situation for Labour coming in. And that's, that's the challenge. The, the challenge is, unlike in 1997, I mean, in 1997, it was obvious the country needed a big program of social and liberal change. We had, I think, only 10% of the MPs were women, you know, gay people didn't have equality, uh, there'd be no black cabinet minister, we didn't have a mayor of London, we didn't have devolved a, a, a parliament or assembly, there was no peace process in Northern Ireland, no minimum wage. Okay, it, we get it, right. we get it. <laughs> but the point is, there was lots for us to do that, if you like, were, were things that didn't cost money to do. Well, you had money though as well, didn't you? Let's be honest. You had growth, you had uh, debt levels were, I think, 37% in 97, now well over 100. Right, so the economy, having gone through a difficult patch, to be fair to John Major and Ken Clark, the thing was much more stabilised. So we had to keep the economy going. And you, you spent know. money. You, you, know, you increased education spending by 83%, health spending more than doubled yeah, in real time. terms. Yeah, yeah, we did over time, exactly. So, so our task was to rebuild the public realm and keep the economy moving along properly. And, you know, we made significant economic changes too, but the point I'm making is exactly the one you're, you're implying, which is it was a lot easier for us. Labour's coming into this time into a much, much more difficult situation where everything is constrained. And therefore, the question is, it's, it's not just what do you do? I think it's what do you do to offer hope to people? Because otherwise people think, OK, it's grim and maybe we should put the Conservatives out, but what is Labour going to do for us when it comes in? And this is where I think the big challenge is, but I think it's a challenge that Labour can meet. I, mean, I guess my big question is what does a Labour government or a progressive government look like if there's no money left? What, what, what does that look like? Yeah, so I think there are, we've identified four things we think you could do over one parliament. Leave aside all the technology stuff, which is longer term, but some of it could be done immediately. But the four things you could do immediately that would help, you could reform our planning system, which is a huge problem, by the way, means there is no possibility of this country meeting its climate change targets at the moment. I mean, absolutely zero possibility. OK, so reforming the planning system would be a big economic boost. So basically, local concerns are yeah, you, You're going to have to take a decision. If these national infrastructure projects matter, and remember, we're, as a country, even with a Conservative government, saying we're going to more than double electricity within a decade. You know, it's... We will go through some of the figures next week and just show people the gap between what we've promised and the reality is massive. So there's planning. Um, then you've got uh, changes in the investment rules, which we've set out recently as to how you get much more money flowing from our pension funds into investment in British infrastructure and British companies. You've got to deal with the labour shortage problem and then you've got to fix the Brexit relationship. So, you know, those are four things that would take you some time to do, but would, I think, have an immediate impact on growth. But the big question for the future is technology. And you've got some ideas on that as well, um, particularly on the health service, I was quite interested to see. Yeah, the, it, if, if you look at healthcare today, it's, it's going to undergo a complete revolution. You're going to be able to diagnose diseases 
and conditions much earlier. In fact, actually, you better do a lot of it from birth through, through um, genetics. You're going to be in a situation where people can manage their own conditions. You know, we all got used to testing uh, during COVID testing ourselves, but actually there's going to be a lot more that you can do. AI is going to transform things like radiology. I mean, a whole lot of processes within healthcare uh, can be digitized. And then AI is also going to mean that you're going to develop many more cures and treatments than we have now. So you've got the whole question about healthcare is how do you reimagine it so that it operates on a completely different basis? So you switch from treating illness, which is why the health service was, was created, to, to prevention and well-being. We often you know, talk about the NHS in quite a sort of starry-eyed way, if you like. Do, do you think that actually it is providing a good standard of care, if you look at international comparisons? Uh, no, at the moment it's, I mean, in some respects it is. Obviously, the staff do a great job in difficult circumstances. And I think the general experience of people is that if, it's, if you're in really acute difficulty, uh, then, it, then it still does provide very good care. But a lot of the you know, waiting lists are, are terrible. Um, COVID, of course, has made it all worse. No, we, we've, but the truth is you're not going to have a lot more money to spend. But you do have to think, how do we do things completely differently? I mean, doing things completely differently, that's a big task for the NHS. Do you think there should be more private sector involvement? Well, there should just be a, there should be a, a complete cooperation between public and private sector in two respects. Obviously, you can use capacity that's in the, the private sector, as, as it did we did when we were in power. But I think there's another thing that's going to be really relevant. A lot of these innovations, particularly innovations that, you know, like the wearables, okay, that, that people have and, the, and your ability to offer probably, you know, what, what you might call low complexity but high volume things, a lot of it can be offered through the private sector. And what so we shouldn't s- be a dirty word then? No, of course not. Because, you know, the, the problem always with the public sector, and this is what I learned in government, is the tough thing is to get it to innovate. Okay, because in the private sector, if you don't innovate, you go out of business. But it doesn't happen in the public sector. So the question is... Do you think the NHS would have got out of business by now? Well, the, the NHS is a great institution in its principles and we should keep those principles. But the truth, I mean, you don't have to be a you know, a genius to look at it and say it's not, it's not serving its purpose. And by the way, the numbers of people we've employed in the health service has risen, not fallen. Um, what about um, you also talking about um, AI and the challenges of AI more widely as well? It often feels to people like AI can be a bit of a scary thing. Do you think we should be embracing it more? Um, well, you know, I asked someone who's an expert in this the other day, and I'm not, but I said to me, so is it good or is it bad? And he said, it's good and bad. He said, it's like any general purpose technology. It's, it's like fire or you know, nuclear power. You can use it for good, you can use it for bad. But the, it's a fact. And, and here's the thing that I think is really important for politics, because you know, I, I spent a long time in politics. I was 10 years prime minister. So I'm reasonably experienced in politics. But this is what happens to me when I talk to a lot of politicians, not just here, anywhere, about technology. And they say, yeah, it's really interesting. And now let's get back to talk about politics. And I'm saying to them, no, guys, you've got to understand, this is the equivalent of the 19th century Industrial Revolution. It's going to change everything. It's not something that you think about at the end of the day when you've done your proper day job in politics. This is the mission. And for people on the progressive side of politics, it is the mission. It's the only way you're going to reignite optimism, transform the state, make it work more effectively and more cost effectively. And here's the other piece of good news for Britain. In this technology space, we have real advantages, big advantages, and we've got to preserve them and, 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 and you know, develop them. But it's not just the answer to how you reimagine how the state operates. It's also, this is the future for the British economy. At the beginning of the section when we were talking about what the conference was about, things that a new government could do, you mentioned Brexit. And some people would say, look, part of the reason, not the whole reason, but part of the reason that our economy is doing badly is because of the knock-on causes of Brexit. Do you think a Labour government should pursue a closer relationship with the EU, given that Keir Starmer's ruled out rejoining the single market and the customs union? Yes, I, I, I do. So you, you've got, 
rejoining, mm -hmm. which I think is very difficult. Um, rejoining the EU, you're talking yeah, about. Rejoining yeah, rejoining the EU. And the reason it's very difficult is that we've spent seven years completely diverted in government from dealing with a lot of the big issues because we've had to deal with Brexit. I think, I mean, I would love it if it had never happened, obviously, mm -hmm. you, you, you know that, but I think if you were to go back into a, a negotiation, actually go fully back into the EU at this, at this moment in time, a future generation, you know, that's another matter, but I think it would be a huge diversion for the, the, the government. But the second thing is, I think this country is only going to be ready to rejoin when it's strong. Mm. You, you don't want to go back into the European Union on, on your knees. There are, there are other things you could do, though. How no, about absolutely. rejoining the so customs? I was going to, recently, we published a paper that set out a whole lot of things to give us a closer relationship with Europe, including aligning with the regulatory framework in, in, in Europe in areas where British business wants us to do so. And then in cooperating in other big areas around energy but we and have climate. But we have to be real, right? You, you said that right now we're in a weak position. Why would uh, the EU give us a deal where we can just cherry pick the best bits? Surely they're going to say, OK, if you want to rejoin the customs union, that means X. If you want to rejoin effectively the single market, you're going to have to accept more immigration from the EU, more yeah. payments into the budget. Do we so, need to be real about that? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a very good point. So you're going to have to put this together with a whole set, set of things where we're also doing things that Europe's going to find attractive. And what do you think we should be willing to compromise on there then? Well, I don't think it's, it's so much a matter of compromising and saying, where are the areas that, that Europe's going to want us to work with them? And there you can see a, a lot of them, for example, science, which is one of the reasons why it's so important that we rejoin this Horizon programme. There are things that we can do with Europe and for Europe that, that will help. Also, Europe itself, I think, you know, it also recognises now that the loss of Britain is a, is a problem for Europe, and, and it is. And when you look at this technology space, the absence of Britain from the room where Europe will decide its regulatory policy for artificial intelligence would you, would you, is a problem. Would you accept free movement of people? Um, well, you're not going to go back to do that unless you go back into the, the single market. But I do think for labour shortages in certain areas, we should be making it much easier for Europeans to come here and to work here. Um, I'm interested to get your thoughts on Ukraine, if I may as well, because I know that you're interested in international stuff as well, of course. What do you think the end game in Ukraine looks like? I think like? for labour shortages in certain areas, we should be making it much easier for Europeans to come here and to work here. Um, I'm interested to get your thoughts on Ukraine, uh, if I may as well, because I know that you're interested in international stuff as well, of course. What do you think the end game in Ukraine looks like? Mm, well, it's a difficult question, I know. Yeah, it's... So I think there are, <clears throat> there are two issues. The first is what is Ukraine's relationship with the West, NATO membership, European Union membership, and the second question is what do you do about territory? And I think it's you know, extremely difficult to see how you get a solution to this unless it's very clear that Ukraine has a clear path to European Union membership and a clear path to NATO membership. And I think probably people will wait and see what happens out of this Ukrainian counteroffensive. Um, and, you know, the Ukrainians have done an extraordinary job in defending their country and, by the way, defending us by defending their country. But I think it will be how you you, you deal with those two issues together and it's, uh, this is going to be extremely difficult but I do think once we take stock after the counteroffensive, we've got to see if there is a way to bring it to an end with a negotiated end to it. And do you think territory may have to come into that? Well I think territory is going to be the most difficult thing because Ukrainians will never accept that the territory that, I mean, from an international community point of view has been taken wrongly from them should be left with, with Russia. So this is going to be the most difficult thing for sure. This US election next year, Donald Trump looks the most likely candidate for the Republicans. We know what his view is on Ukraine. You can very much see him pulling American support. Um, do you, are you worried that the US backing for Ukraine may start to dry up next year? I mean, I hope, I mean, I don't know, but I hope that a Trump presidency would not mean that, even if that were to happen, because it would be completely disastrous if America withdrew its support from Ukraine. And I think the way that President Biden has managed to marshal support for Ukraine and keep people pretty much on the same page has been you know, a significant act of statesmanship. So I, I, 
Now, I hope that's not the case, but, but because let's be clear, I think the other thing just to say this to you about Ukraine, I think the most important thing talking to Ukrainians, and my institutes had a project in Ukraine for many years, they want an end to this, which is on terms that make it clear that no Russian president, not this one or any successive one, can ever come back and do this again. And I think that will be the overwhelming desire in Eastern Europe as well. So for that to happen, that American support has to be firm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now I want to finish with a question that I think might make you roll your eyes, okay? Um, but I don't know what your thoughts on it, so I'm, I'm quite interested to know. Okay. Um, Hugh Edwards, what's your take on how that story's been handled? Well, I, I'm not going to roll my eyes, but I don't, I honestly don't know the, I don't, I don't think anyone knows the facts. And I feel sorry for everyone involved. You know, these are very, very you know, human situations. And, and you know, obviously, like, like you, I've known him for, for many years. I, I, I don't really have any great insight. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I just, I hope it all gets resolved in a way that, you know, keeps people, keeps people in good health and, and resolves whatever issues that have happened. But I don't really... I'm not an expert on this. I understand. Um, I guess there are sort of wider questions about the BBC, and there's kind of two perspectives here. One is that the BBC is effectively stumbling from crisis to crisis, and the other is that actually there are other institutions who have got the BBC in their sights. They're kind of gunning for the BBC, if you like. And I just wonder, what's your view here on the BBC? So my, my view on the BBC is, and I've had my run-ins with the BBC. As, yeah, as, we know. Yeah, well documented. Um, but I think it's a great British institution. And I, I mean, of course, these things will happen from time to time, but I don't think it means that the whole of the BBC is now a bad institution. And I think, you know, frankly, the BBC should stand up for itself a bit more, to be, to be blunt about it. And also, by the way, abroad, the BBC is still regarded as an important British institution. And given our need to make sure we keep as much of our position of power in the world as we can, you know, I'm... So whatever my you know, disagreements from time to time, no, I'm, I'm, I still basically support it. Um, and then just finally, I think it's 16 years since you were Prime Minister, and whenever I interview you, there is some burning political issue that you want to talk about, whether it's testing during COVID now, whether it's the impact that artificial intelligence is going to have on the UK and the world as well. Do you find it a bit hard to let go? <laughs> it's not, I mean, I've had to let go, I mean, but, but it's... No, You're not chillaxing in the shepherd's hut, though, right? No, no, that's never going to be me. So it's, but I'm fascinated by the world. And the single thing that is, in a way, most um, strange and almost a little, at times, it's a bit shocking, is how much I've learned since leaving office. It's a fascinating world out there. And if I've any, so I say this to any young people I meet in Britain today, go and learn about the world, because the biggest risk for a country like Britain, especially given our history, is that we you know, we, we become insular, we don't understand how fast the world is changing and how absolutely vital it is to understand those changes. Because if you can't understand them, you can't make them work for you. Given you've learned so much since you've left office, if you could go back and change one thing that you did, what would you, what would you do? There'd be a lot, there'd be a list. <laughs> but, but I'm best to leave that to others to speculate on. Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.